Chapter 13 Into the Deep Kopi found himself before the council of Leanne Sarun. Standing upon the elevated dais, he had no time to absorb all that he had seen. It had been a blur from when the submarine arrived and taken him down into the blue city upon the ocean floor. What is your name? instructed the blue-haired chancellor with an eel-like appearance standing across from him. Kobe Dumas, he answered nervously. You have claimed to be the singularity and bear the imperial edge, said the chancellor with a snide expression upon his face. We will now test your claim. For every right answer you provide, the dais you stand upon will lower. Answer enough questions correctly, and the dais will be on the floor, or you will be free to go as an honorary citizen of Leanserun. Answer incorrectly, however, the Chancellor's head lifted to the ceiling. Kobe lifted his eyes and froze. There, pressed against a see-through dome that depressed out of the roof, was a multi-limbed creature whose circular mouth was lined with sharp teeth. Like a horrible fusion between an octopus and a shark, it writhed and bumped itself against the dome, desperate to get upon Kobe on the dais. Then you shall be her lunch, along with all the other singularities that have come before you, he smiled evilly. Octoshark, Kobe heard his mind link say inside his mind, highly aggressive predator of Leanserun seas, can also traverse on land, avoid at all costs. Kobe couldn't speak his voice frozen in his throat at the sight of the horror. He had said very little as the guardsmen took him aboard the round submarine down to the illuminated city. Kirby had seen the enormous blue conch shell that lay at the centre of the blue city. The buildings surrounding it also displayed varying sized shells. Every building was elevated off the ground on metal supports and were connected to each other via the rips. Kobe's mind link had said it was transportation that could carry someone from one place to another on a controlled current of water. It was a rip that brought Kobe to the council's shell, a dark blue shell with bright spots on the exterior. Within, Kobe had been led straight to the inner chamber, a round room where the council had been waiting for him. He stepped onto the dais, which raised him up to be at eye level with the councillors, who sat on elevated podiums in a semicircle before him. Two podiums directly before Kobe were empty. They were slightly higher than the rest of the others. Do you have any questions? said the Chancellor, catching Kobe's attention. I, um, stumbled Kobe. There's no way I cannot be the singularity, can I? If you wish to renounce your claim, you will be fed to the Octo Shark immediately, said the Councillor plainly. Kobe felt the dice rise. Wait, wait, I am the singularity, he sputtered, and the dice stopping returning back to its previous location. False claims to the singularity are treason, said the Chancellor. Whether it's fast or slow, the result will be the same, he said without a hint of remorse. Kirby felt his throat go dry, his body cold with fear. The questioning will now, began the Chancellor, but a bell sounded and the councillors all gathered rose. Their attention turned to the highest elevated seat and a skinny blue-haired man with sunken eyes appeared. He nodded at the councillors without a word and took his seat. He turned his eyes to Kobe, a deep, almost black pair of eyes fixed upon him. We are honoured to be in the presence of the King of Leanne Zeroon, Sidon. Your Grace, would you like to conduct the questions? asked the Chancellor. A raspy voice replied, You may proceed. I will watch and listen, said King Sidon, eyes not leaving Kobe. Very good, Your Grace. There will be nine questions. The more that are correct and incorrect will determine if you leave or if you're eaten. Kobe looked up at the Octo Shark, who circled above him. Question one, announced the Chancellor. What is your age? Twenty-one, answered Kobe. Correct, said the Chancellor, a hint of disappointment in his voice. What does the mother give us? asked the Chancellor. Kobe remembered the whitehead from the library. Colour, he answered. Correct said the Chancellor. A few murmurs went through the chamber as the dais lowered for a second time. Question three. What are the three beasts of Gaia? A sneer upon his face. Kirby's mind went blank, his mind link saying nothing. I don't know, he answered. Incorrect answer, replied the Chancellor with a smirk as the dais raised up. Question four. What are the nine colours of the edges? He asked. Kirby racked his brain. Red, blue, 
yellow, he began green, purple, violet, orange, black, and white. He finished feeling confident. Correct, said the Chancellor, somewhat taken aback. Kirby felt the king lean forward in his seat as the dais lowered to the ground. The tally is three correct answers to two incorrect. Four questions remain. Question five. What happens to a city if they lose their edge? He asked. I don't know, Kirby replied and suggested. They fade? Incorrect. The grey is a myth. Even with the edge taken, the colour remains, said the Chancellor, as the diest rays upwards towards the monster, pressing itself against the clear dome. That makes an even number of correct and incorrect. Three questions remain to determine your fate. Question, began the Chancellor. Allow me the final three questions, said a voice interrupting him. The Chancellor gazed around, surprised, to see who had spoken, and locked eyes with the King of Leansarun. As you wish, Your Grace, said the Chancellor, collecting himself. Kirby felt all eyes go towards the skeletal appearing king. To Kirby, the king seemed like a normal man, unlike the rest of the people he seed in Lian Sarun. But there seemed to be something about his blue eyes that unsettled him. He stared at Kirby, not seeming to blink. There is a man who visited me long ago, said King Sidon, who told stories of ancient past, of colours used as weapons of dragons who destroyed and created sun and stars, of places that exist outside of what we hear, see and touch. Tell me, Singularity, who is this man? rasped the king, dragging out every word as though it were his last. I, began Kirby, thinking fast, I can only think of one person I think it could be. The king leaned forward, eyes glinting with excitement. Abe Sue, said Kirby. It must have been Abe. All eyes of the chamber went back to the king, who nodded slowly, and Kobe felt the dais lower towards the ground. His heart raced. Only one more correct answer, and he would be free. Second last question, said King Sidon. What are the names of the brothers and sister worms, the scourge of the galaxy? All eyes went to Kobe, who went cold. I don't know, he answered, feeling the skin on his body prickle. The dais raised upwards, so high that it was just below the horrible monster that lashed it bit at the dome, inches away from where Kobe stood. He could hear the scraping and tearing upon the glass as it desperately sought to reach him. Final question, said the king, who was at eye level with Kobe. I commend you for making this far. None before you have made it to the final question. All claims to the singularity have died much sooner, he said somewhat nonchalantly. There is only one answer you can provide for the final question. The king stood up and revealed a pair of blue shoes that sparkled under the lights. The chamber all gasped except for Kobe, who didn't know their significance. These shoes are the edge of Lian Sarun, he said, and tossed them onto the dais where Kobe stood. Your grace, protested the eel counsellor. Surely you don't mean to... Silence, shot back King Sidon. The final question is mine to choose. The chancellor fumed silently glaring at Kobe. Put on the edge of Leanne Saroon, and we will see if you are who you claim to be. Kobe stripped off his space suit upon the dais, allowing his bare feet to fit into the shoes. As he touched them, he felt a ripple of energy course through his body, like a wave of cool water. The shoes slipped onto his feet, seemingly adjusting to his foot size, creating an instant comfortable fit. It was then he heard a sound. A distant sound of horns filled his ears. Kobe glanced around and saw the chamber was hearing it as well, their faces puzzled and confused. The sound of the horns grew louder, of trombones and trumpets, of saxophones and clarinets, and of French horns and bassoons all mixed into harmonious cacophony. Kobe brought his eyes down and saw the shoes he had put on were no longer just upon his feet. They were growing up upon his legs like corals over rocks. It snaked its way up both of his legs, turning his shoes into boots that kept growing. He felt a surge of something awaken inside him, a hidden part of himself that seemed to be unlocked with the blue edge. He saw images flash within his mind and information began to pour out like a waterfall. He saw people wearing blue shoes and swimming through the water like fishes. He saw people down at the bottom of the ocean walking as though it were land. He saw the people of Lian Sarun building their city with the aid of the edge, the construction only possible by harvesting resources on the ocean floor. The information crashed over him as the edge grew upon his legs, creating blue shin guards that raised up to a sharp point over his knee. 
Kobe could no longer see the chamber. He was transported to another place, of apparitions and beings that came and went, all who wore the blue edge. He realised what he was seeing was people who had worn the edge previously. The flashes slowed down, and Kobe saw King Sidon and a blue-haired woman he did not recognise. The horns in the chamber grew so loud that the chancellors had covered their ears, all except King Sidon who watched on, his stony expression masking his emotion. Kobe opened his eyes to the chamber once more as the horns suddenly stopped, the chamber going quiet and the information overload coming to an end. The chamber viewed Kobe, some from behind their chairs, others with broad grins and others with looks of utter contempt. Kobe found the eyes of King Sidon, whose expression had changed from cold to that of a hint of a smirk. Correct, he said, with a smile blossoming upon his worn face. You are indeed who you claim to be. Lower the dais, ordered the king. Kobe felt the dais descend and lock back into the floor. He gazed up. The octoshark within the dome was nowhere to be seen. Kirby felt the power of the edge coursing through his body. He brought his eyes down and saw a pool of water emanating outwards. Stepping off the dais, the water followed wherever he stepped. The edge wants to be in the water, said a raspy voice of the king as he approached Kobe across the floor. He was skeletal thin, with wispy blue hair that clung to his skull in strands. His face was gaunt and sallow, appearing very ill to Kobe. He moved uncomfortably towards him. In my youth, I took the edge through the seas of Lian Sarun, discovering all its hidden treasures. But you know that, don't you? You saw me? Kobe nodded that he did. The edge shows many things, strange things, said the king. Beware of the wisdom you've gained, Kobe. It can aid you, or it can hinder you, he cautioned, leaning close. It has cost many wearers their mind, and even their lives. Though knowledge is nothing without application, it is because of this I must ask you to return the edge to me. The singularity test has been passed. What the edge has given you is yours forever, but the edge itself is not, he said sternly. Kobe remembered what he'd been sent to Gaia for. The edge was already upon his feet. He could feel its power coursing through him. He could take it for himself. There would be no one to stop him. Yet he didn't. He felt a connection to this man for some reason, one that he could not explain. How do I take them off? said Kobe, finally. The king appeared relieved. You simply think of them as they were before, and they will turn back to their original form. Kobe did so, and watched as the plated boots shrank back into the shoes he'd been given. His feet slipped out, and he handed the edge back to King Sidon. You have my thanks, said the king, putting the edge back on. They fawned quickly upon his legs. You could have very easily taken them when they were offered to you. It is why the chancellors were so worried. It was a calculated risk to prove your claim, one that could have cost Leanne Saroon its edge. Kobe saw that the king stood straighter with the edge upon his legs, appearing somewhat rejuvenated. Now that you are an honorary citizen of Leanne Saroon, you are welcome to stay in the Blue Keep and explore my city as you see fit, though I must caution outside the city's outskirts. There are those who do not abide by the same judiciary process and laws that we have in the city, Kobe. You will not be welcomed by all who live beneath the waves, said the king with an expression of sadness. He bade Kobe farewell and asked him to return in the morning to talk more. Kobe was shown by two guards to a blue room overlooking a spectacular neon-coloured reef that stretched out beneath his window. Weary, Kobe disrobed and climbed into the blue waterbed that sloshed and jiggled until it lulled him into a deep sleep, his mind filled with things the edge had shown him, along with that of his friends.